So first, it is my pleasure to introduce Matt DeMarco, who is the VP Account Manager in the Design Contribution Practice. So take it away, Matt. Well, thanks, Leah, and good morning, everyone, and, and thank you again for having us. I know we're really excited to launch the RAE Small CIT version 3 um, at the end of August uh, for access for all of you. So now, before I even jump into RAE Small and introduce my colleague to my left, Raji Manasa, who some of you may be familiar with, uh, I just want to take a step back and say thank you. Uh, about two years ago, we launched uh, the PIMCO RAE International CIT um, with NFP and RPAG. And since we've launched, we've been able to grow that strategy to just over $525 million today. So uh, without the hard work of all of you, none of that would be possible. So I just want to take a second and say thank you. Uh, second is we'd love to make this conversation as conversational as possible. So Leah, to that extent, uh, Raji and I, just the way this conference room is formatted, we can't really see the questions that are coming in. So if questions are coming in, feel free to jump in and stop us at any time. We want to make sure that we're getting all of your questions answered. So, so with that, um, we know RAE Small is set to launch at the end of August, August 31st launch date. Um, we know both RAE International and RAE Small score a, a 10 on the RPAG scoring system. And it's my understanding that we're set to launch RAE Small uh, for the R1 share class at 41 basis points, so about a 25% discount to the mutual fund. That's something we're really excited about. Um, for those of you that are already familiar with the RA International story, uh, some of this may be a little bit repetitive. Uh, you know, our process and philosophy is going to be exactly the same for RAE Small as it is for RAE International, albeit obviously a different asset class. So with that backdrop, I'm happy to turn it over to Raji, who's going to take a couple minutes and just give you a little bit of background on Research Affiliates Equity, their partnership with PIMCO, how we think about our systematic and time-tested approach to and value investing across both PIMCO, RE International, and RE Small. And then we'll give you a quick introduction and performance philosophy of RE Small with, of course, answering any questions that you have. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Raji, who's going to share his screen right now. Let me know if you can't see it, and we'll just take a deeper dive into the PIMCO RE strategies. Well, th thank you, Matt. Uh, thank you, Leah, and good morning to all of you. It's really, really great to be with you again um, after launching the RE International strategy uh, two years ago and, and now getting into the same strategy, but to the U.S. small cap space. And, and we think um, it's a great opportunity. It's a great time for the strategy. Um, and before I even talk about the strategy, I thought it'd be helpful just to give you some perspective of equity markets. Uh, in 2022. I think uh, there's been a lot of consternation. There's been a lot of uh, changes of leadership uh, within the, uh, the global equity markets. And so I think that context is really important because how uh, the markets are positioned is how I'm sure you are thinking about selecting funds and selecting uh, managers for your client's lineup. Um, and that's going to be really important. I'm going to share my, my screen. Um, and, you know, the, the one thing that we all know is that all asset classes are down tremendously year to date, uh, but they're not all down to the same magnitude. Um, just within the U.S. equity market, uh, the big sort of betas or big rivers, the Dow Jones, the S&P 500 and the NASDAQ, all down, but to different extents. Um, more old economy stocks like the Dow Jones down 15 percent. Uh, the more new economy stocks, like the NASDAQ, down 30%. And we know, and we can all name those stocks that are down 70 or 80 or 90%. Um, there are some themes going on within the market. Um, there's been a flight to safety. Uh, so large caps have marginally outperformed small caps. There's been a sensitivity to valuations, which means value stocks have outperformed growth stocks. And of course, there's the geopolitical volatility, there's the inflation story. And so energy has been that lone sector that's generated positive performance. Uh, well, anything touching um, speculative growth, uh, the consumer uh, communications and technology, those stocks have borne the brunt of the sell-off. What's interesting to me is when I speak to um, plan participants and plan sponsors, 
Um, within these different sectors of the equity market, the cheaper stocks have outperformed the more expensive ones, which means cheaper technology has outperformed more expensive technology. Cheaper financials have outperformed more expensive financials. So a valuation sensitivity has definitely taken the market by storm. But leading up to this market, leading up to this sell-off, um, I think when you spoke to investors, they were pretty bullish about 2022. And it was a continuation of the recovery, the COVID recovery story, the stay-at-home story, the new economy story that had many people talking. Well, leading up to 2022, we started to have some imbalances in the equity market. And we told ourselves some narratives that justified both the concentration risk in the equity market and the valuations we were placing on these stocks. Uh, this graph on the left-hand side of your, of your screen, what's that? Well, the blue line is showing you, since the 1980s, how much the top five holdings take up in the S&P 500. So the larger names in the broad market index usually just as a good course, take up 10 to 15% of the market. That's normal. What's not normal is that since 2016, the top five stocks have taken up 20%. Even with the recent sell-off year to date, the top five stocks still represent nearly 20% of the S&P 500. The other 495 stocks make up the rest. That still feels imbalanced. and the kind of leading stocks of the past five or six years, Facebook, Amazon, Netflix, Google, Microsoft, Apple, you know the names, those stocks have been as large as 20 to 25% of the S&P 500. Again, even with the sell-off year to date, those six stocks are still over 20% of the S&P. And when you think about concentration risk, it's the unintended bets that an, even an S&P 500 can present. On the right-hand side of this graph that shows you the top 10 holdings of the NASDAQ, which is again down 30%, showing you those same many of the same stocks still as of June representing the top 10 holdings of the S&P 500. So our caution to investors is when you think about broad market investing, be mindful of the unintended bets and compensate for them, allocate away from those unintended bets so you have a, a balanced portfolio. Um, unintended bets and concentration risks, we've seen this manifest in other ways. So these six stocks, even as of June, would be the third largest country in the world by market cap. With the sell-off, these six stocks are still $7 trillion in market cap, which after the US and China represent the largest country in the world, larger than even Japan, all the publicly traded stocks of Japan, and the three largest European countries. So our main point here is that be careful of concentration risk in the market. Uh, one other exhibit on this point that we think is really interesting is that, again, going back to that story of the narratives that we tell ourselves to justify valuations, um, we don't at all argue with the idea that Apple is changing lives and changing the way we do things, that Amazon is changing the way we shop, or that Google is a new form of advertising that is going to completely change the way things used to be. Our point on these stocks is that the valuation that you're paying for them may be unjustified. So if you kind of rewind the clock back to the 1980s, and you look at in 1980, what were the largest companies in the world, meaning they were the most richly priced and they had outperformed up to that point? Well, they were old industrial companies like General Electric and Eastman Kodak. They were energy companies like Standard Oil and Schlumberger and Exxon. These were companies that seemed inevitable that had outperformed because of the crises of the 1970s. Uh, a lot of recollections today to the 1970s. We know inflation, energy scarcity, et cetera. Well, over the next 10 years in the 1980s, what happened? 
almost every one of those companies fell out of the top largest companies in the world. And they did that by underperforming, by underperforming. What outperformed in the 1980s? Well, nearly every company that became the top name in the 19, by 1990 was Japanese, right? All the headlines, I mean, as, a, as a kid, I remember in the 1980s, Japan was going to eat America's lunch. Those companies were going to become dominant, and those companies were going to take over the world. Of course, in retrospect, that was a bubble. Those narratives didn't quite play out. And by the year 2000, they were replaced with Pets.com and the new economy. The largest companies were dot-com and consumer growth companies. We know in retrospect, again, that that was a bubble. And over the next 10 years, the uh, by 2010, it was a commodities and energy bubble again. And we saw those companies as the largest. So once again, kind of jumping to present day by 2020, these companies that are now leading the market down have become the largest bets in the market. And we're already starting to see some of those fall off the list. So the main point here is that be sensitive of valuations and be sensitive of concentration risk. Uh, three other points to make about value versus growth. Value is always cheaper than growth by definition, but that cheapness can get very wide and can get very narrow. Well, in, in June 2020, it was the widest on record or at the 100th percentile. Despite the past two years of outperformance of value versus growth, we're still in the bottom quartile of all historic measures, meaning there's still a, a, an argument to have a value allocation. Uh, we know from 50 years of markets that value stocks tend to outperform when a bubble is bursting in a bear market by about 5 to 6% a year. A bubble's bursting right now, and value is outperforming at 15% year to date. We also know that when markets are recovering, out of a recession, value tends to outperform because it tends to be more economically sensitive. So our point here is make sure that the plan has an allocation to a good value manager, particularly when inflation is elevated. On the x-axis going across the page left to right, that's annualized inflation by decade. Up and down the page is the outperformance of value versus growth. What do we see here? a very clear relationship between higher uh, levels of inflation and value outperforming growth. Not a required backdrop, but certainly a constructive one for the style. So how do we do value at PIMCO? Well, you know PIMCO for fixed income, but in equities, we have partnered with research affiliates on value strategies. Uh, for those of you who don't know, research affiliates is a systematic equity manager based in Newport Beach, not coincidentally across the street from us here um, at PIMCO. They've been around for 20 years and we have partnered with research affiliates on equity strategies for nearly as long. Uh, they were founded by Rob Arnott uh, and they are led today as their CEO and CIO, Chris Brightman. Rob and Chris, they're the name portfolio managers on the RAE value strategies they are supported by a deep team of academics and practitioners in systematic and quantitatively driven investing. Now, the portfolio, when you look at a small cap value fund from RAE or international strategy from RAE, as Matt said, it's using the exact same chassis to pick the stocks and construct the portfolio. Uh, I think quantitative investing sometimes can alienate people because it sounds complicated. Um, when you look at the strategy, it's actually quite simple and quite intuitive. Step one is that every stock in the universe, in this case, the small cap universe in the United States, is given an RAE score based upon very simple signals. Value, how cheap is the stock? Quality, is that cheap stock a value trap or not? And momentum, is that cheap stock in free fall. By using these three signals, value, quality, momentum, you end up with an RAE score that tells you how attractive each stock is for the portfolio. The model will select the cheapest stocks that are not value traps and not in free fall, 
for the portfolio. And then those selected stocks are weighted based on their fundamentals. So companies with large sales, large cash flow, large dividends and book value, those companies get the larger weights in the fund. And as the markets move around and gyrate, the strategy rebalances back to the model every single quarter. So pretty simple, pretty transparent, select the most attractive stocks based on this value signal, put a couple guardrails in place on quality and price action or momentum, and then weight the stocks based on, based on their fundamentals. So how's it going? Well, over the past 15 years, uh, actually going on 17 years, the RAE small strategy has generated uh, after fee, one to two percent per year. And what's great about that performance is not just the endpoint sensitivity, because I can tell you, I can look at lots of great endpoints for a manager. What's important is that if you pick any endpoint over the past 17 years and you look at it as of five years, 90 to 100 percent of the time, the strategy's outperformed which means if you're dollar cost averaging into your plan, uh, you have a very good chance of outperforming the Russell 2000 value. So consistency is the story. And you can also see top 10 holdings that are very clear, very accessible for most people to understand what they own. Valuation metrics, uh, also cheaper than the market based on a couple different um, multiples. And again, very similar to the international stock CIT, which you also have access to. Uh, very similar consistency, 1% to 2% per year since uh, 2005, 90 to 100% rolling three and five year uh, excess return periods. And again, a valuation um, very attractive, even versus the MSCI EFA value index. So hopefully you hear a couple of things today. The market's ripe for value strategies, which have been left in the dust for the past 10 years. Uh, Research Affiliates has been a partner with PIMCO for 20 years, and we've got great, consistent, low-fee strategies that allow you to outperform even the passive value alternatives on the market. So let me, let me pause there. I've said a lot about the markets and the strategies, but maybe turn it over to Leah if there are any specific questions, either about markets or the investments. Um, we actually just had a question come up a minute ago. Uh, the question is, what are the major catalysts generating a rebalance? That's a great question. So the major catalysts generating a rebalance is going to be, the number one is going to be price. So if a stock is still attractive based upon the signals that I mentioned, its cheapness, its quality, and momentum, RAE is going to top off that position if the stock is sold off. Um, in a similar way, the st strategy will buy stocks, um, you know, uh, if they've appreciated in price. And, and so that's that's one, one instance in which the model will buy more of a stock or trim it. Uh, the other is if something's changed, right? So if the stock is still cheap, but there starts to be indications of poor quality, such as profitability, um, leverage ratios, uh, accruals and cash earnings start going in different directions, the model will be updated based on that latest data and adjust its weight. Uh, so it could either be a fundamental change in the company or it can be a price change. If the fundamentals are stable and the prices become more attractive, that's a buy signal. But if the stock is sold off and the fundamentals have gotten even worse, well, then the model won't buy more of that stock. Perfect. Thank you. That's all the questions for now. Hey, Raj, I can I can tee up another question. So for those of you that are on the line, I'm sure many of you know uh, Kellen Foley from the FlexPath team. Raji and I most recently uh, just did um, kind of a traveling roadshow with Kellen seeing some RPG members. And I think as we were introducing REE Small, um, I think one of those aha moments for a lot of advisors when they think about how can I position this with clients is year-to-date performance. As 
Raji kind of kicked off the call. There's really been nowhere to hide in terms of market performance year to date. But when walking through just small cap values performance, generally speaking, and then REE smalls performance year to date, um, there was kind of those 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 aha moments. So Raji, if you want maybe take a minute or two just to walk through year to date performance for the asset class, generally speaking, and then REE small, I, I think that that would be really helpful, especially as we start to have those, you know, mid-year conversations with a lot of our plan sponsor clients. Uh, we know some of those conversations are definitely going to be tough. This can be a, a silver lining in one of those conversations as we begin to roll this out. Yeah, certainly. So I'm just kind of looking at the performance of the markets year to date. The Russell 2000, uh, the broad market is down over 22%. Um, now the Russell 2000 value, so values outperformed growth, um, down 17%. But the REE strategy is down 12%. So you have the, the RE strategy, which has been, again, looking all, all markets, using its definition of value, outperforming the Russell 2000 by 10 percentage points, and even outperforming the passive value benchmark by 4 to 5%. So that's, that's pretty compelling. And what's, I think, been helping the strategy is that not only is it looking for cheaper stocks, but it's thinking about quality. This is a moment in time where quality has mattered more than it did over the previous five years. So quality of earnings, quality of profitability, quality of balance sheet. When rates are low, capital is flush, um, you know, you can be hyper-leveraged. You can be operating with no earnings but great revenue and get a very high valuation. When you're in a market like this where rates are rising, inflation's cutting into your margins, you're concerned about a, a recession, all of a sudden quality matters and quality starts to get a premium. And so that I think is really the story between, yes, the strategy is down 12%, you know, all markets are down 12%, but the small cap universe in the US is down 22%. And even the value corners of the small cap universe is down 16%. So protecting on the downside is part of the strategy, particularly when, when a bubble is bursting. And I think, you know, Participating on the upside, the strategy has great upmarket participation, but sometimes it really does show its value when protecting client capital on the downside. Thanks, Raji. I think that's really helpful. And then, Ali, I'm going to default back to you, see if there's any additional questions. Um, the one question that I know always seems to come up, and quite frankly, it's probably why we're sitting in the room today talking about RAE small three that we're launching with RPAG um, is capacity constraints. We know that one of the existing managers has performed really well, um, but within its first year uh, of launch, hit its capacity constraints. And obviously, it's a bit large in part due to the RPG network and the, the large clients that you guys are all bringing in. Raji, can you just take a, a minute or two just to talk through RAE small's capacity or lack of capacity constraints. Yeah, certainly. So uh, maybe one of the things you saw on the characteristics page uh, was the fact that this strategy, this fund has roughly two to 300 stocks in it. So it's highly diversified. And that means that we have uh, more capacity than a more concentrated equity manager that may have only 50 stocks in it. The turnover in the fund, it's not something that we talked about, is also relatively low. If you think about the average turnover of an equity fund in our business, it's about 100% in a normal market. Um, this strategy has about 40% turnover. So lower turnover and more diversification makes for higher capacity. Uh, the other point is that really up until recently, this was not uh, a strategy that was widely available to the public. So we only have about half a billion in assets under management. And based upon the liquidity analysis of research affiliates, we could manage six, seven billion. And so I think when you think about, uh, you know, there are, there was a joke uh, when we were talking to clients in the RPG network a couple of weeks ago, they're either good managers that are closed or underperforming bad managers that are open. Uh, this is a rare circumstance in which we have a great track record that is open and still has lots of capacity. Two questions that recently just came in. Uh, first one, is the fund now available on the participant agreement? 
That um, so we are set to go live on August 31st. So August, I mean, if there's initial interest, please let us know. We will be able to kind of get you up and running on on that 831 launch date. We'll have the participant agreements in place. Basically, the information that we we'll just need from you just to help kind of get it running. If you want to be one of the seed investors is the record keeper that you're working with. So we can work with them on making sure it's available on day one. Um, please let myself or your local account manager know, uh, PIMCO account manager know, and we can work with you on making sure that it's available on 831 for you and get all that paperwork in in advance of 831. That's something that we can uh, can, can definitely work on with you. And then Lee, I don't know if there was another question. Yes, uh, okay. So the question says, it looks like energy rate is at 20.5% uh, as of June month end. Does the strategy employ in sector weight limit? That's a great question. So uh, the strategy does have an overweight to energy today. Uh, and I can tell you that this actually is a good example of how the strategy works. So in 2020, uh, I think many of you on the line remember when a barrel of oil went negative uh, during the COVID crash. Uh, pretty, pretty remarkable. Um, and RAE, the, the small cap strategy, was actually underweight energy during that period. Um, despite the fact that it was in free fall, which means it was cheap and getting cheaper, that free fall signal momentum meant that the model did not yet buy energy. So despite the fact that those stocks were getting cheap, they were getting cheaper. And so the model essentially waited throughout 2020 uh, at an underweight until the fourth quarter to start going overweight. That's when the negative momentum of the market started to run out. Remember that news of the vaccine uh, came out in September and people started to get their uh, COVID shots in January. Markets started to price in recovery and REE went overweight energy in the fourth quarter of 2020 and increased that overweight in 2021, where you had really the stars align a cheap asset with positive momentum. So REE's uh, overweight was a tailwind for 2021. Clearly, it's been a tailwind for 2022. But as those stocks have started to become richer, the strategy is slowly peeling that overweight back. And so I've seen this happen before in a variety of our strategies across different countries and different sectors. Um, the strategy will take active weights versus the market. Now, the, your, your question, though, is about are there guardrails around sector weights? Uh, could you have, you know, utilities all of a sudden become 40% of the portfolio? Remember that we weight stocks based on their fundamentals. Sectors are then weighted based upon the stocks, which means only companies that have large fundamentals, large sales, cash flow, dividends, and book value will get large weights. So one implicit guardrail on sector weights is simply the fundamentals of the companies themselves. You're not going to get a sector with companies with large fundamentals um, become small, and you're not going to get a sector with small fundamentals get large. So that's number one. And then number two is that there, there's also, this is getting a little into the weeds on the model, the strategy will overlay or look at both a sector neutral picture of what's cheap and a sector agnostic picture as to what's cheap and essentially blend the two, which means the sector will always be, the, the model will always be looking for cheap technology stocks um, and avoid simply loading up on cheap financials, cheap industrials, cheap energy, the typical value sectors. So there is some um, acknowledgement to the sector weights of the market, both A, on the fundamentals, like I mentioned, and then B, on the view of value in a sector uh, considered way. So ho hopefully, hopefully that helps. And you can also imagine a scenario in 2023 where we're underweight energy again. Well, I'm happy to, to wrap it up. And again, just to, to summarize one, you know, we're really excited to launch again. It's an 831 launch date of uh, both RA International, which RA International is available today. 
Um, the R1 share class for RE International is 36.6 basis points. When RAE small launches, it'll be at 41 basis points. And again, that's compared to the 52 basis point fee for the mutual fund. Um, one quick point I, I just want to make sure to clear up as well. I know many RPAG members have traditionally used uh, are the PIMCO stocks plus strategies in the past where there's some fixed income overlay for both RAE International in this case and RAE Small, we're, own, we're holding and owning the physical securities. So that makes the conversations with clients very simple. It's very black and white. When you're looking at the underlying holdings, you're going to be holding the physical stocks versus any sort of fixed income overlay or collateral. Um, and then last but not least, both RAE Small and RAE International score uh, 10 points on the RPAG scorecard. Uh, we don't anticipate that to change at all uh, when the new scores come out, I believe next week, uh, both should and will still score um, a 10. So again, if there's any questions that come up as you dive through this, if you want uh, a version or copy of the deck that we just went over, feel free to reach out to myself or your PIMCO account manager, and we're happy uh, to pass that over to you. And we're in the process right now of finalizing um, for RPAG, a uh, one-page cheat sheet for both RAE International and RAE Small, which highlights a lot of the points um, in a succinct manner of, of what we discussed today, performance, periods of outperformance, fees, et cetera. So be on the lookout uh, for that from your account manager in the next week or two. And again, we're really excited to launch here next month. So if there are no other questions, we're, we're happy to give you some of your time back. And again, thank you all uh, for the time today. Um, and again, for your continued support of PIMCO and the RPAG CIT. So thank you again.